wonderful to be here, Jackson. I've never been to this community television before, and though it seems like it's a little further away since the country, it's really a beautiful, beautiful campus. A very nice chemistry department with the state of the art laboratories, and the auditorium is just phenomenal. So I'm very excited about being here. And since I'm a chemist and I'm interested in energy and I'm interested in trying to reduce pollution, I thought I'd do this very uh, this topic that's in terms of events everywhere. So we're going to look at chemical reactions that would power electric cars. And mainly the center point for powering electric cars is the battery. Okay? So this is mainly going to be hands-on. We're going to mainly be doing laboratories, but I have a short presentation, and then we'll get to the labs. Once we get to the laboratories, then I'll tell you to wear your goggles because safety is very important. Uh, <clears throat> when you leave the lab today, you should probably wash your hands with the sink or down there at the bathroom. And handle some metal electrodes here. And you may want to remove them from your fingers. But all in all, it's a pretty safe laboratory. So to begin here, it turns out that to power cars by electricity, you're going to use chemistry, OK? And there are some electric cars on the market. Nissan has a product called Leaf, which I'm not very familiar with. The Tesla here, I think it's made in California, has been in the news an awful lot. It's a very beautiful car from what I understand. And pretty reliable. The problem here with the Tesla is that the price is $162,000. They tell me if you really want a good Tesla, you need to spend hundred k So not, not very many of us can afford that. Fisker Automotive had an electric car, and Fisker basically went out of business. They went bankrupt within the last month. And then here in Michigan, since we're very centered on the auto industry, we've had some battery factories to build some of these new generation batteries, and they're having some problems too. Okay. Uh, there's, a, there's a Nissan Leaf, and uh, I got some misinformation. I put, put the slide in. And then, of course, we have the uh, Chevy Volt, which I'll talk about a little bit more. And none of these electric cars have been extremely successful sales right now, but they're in their infancy. And hopefully, they'll be able to get the cost down and so that more and more consumers can buy them and reduce pollution. So, battery is a device that stores chemical energy. It converts chemical energy from a chemical reaction into electrical energy. The electrical energy then is used in an electrical circuit to drive a motor and make the motor run. Just like if you have little toy batteries and you can put a battery on a motor and turn it on and it'll run. We could you can actually make a simple battery at home. You take a uh, lemon, for example, put an iron, iron nail on one side, get a little piece of zinc, kind of stab that in there without cutting yourself. You can either get a light bulb or if you can, Get one of these additional multimeter video shack or somewhere else. We're going to be using these today. Take an alligator clip, you can buy these at video shack as well. You connect the one probe, try to get a good connection there. And then another alligator clip on the other probe here. And turn it on and uh, put it on DC bolts, which is over here. And you can connect it right up to the two metal parts electrodes on the lemon juice and kind of bring this around. It went from zero to 0.4 volts. Now, an alkaline battery probably knows about 1.5 volts. Just so just from doing this, by having two different metals to, you know, connected together, and you need some kind of a medium that is a fluid and has ions in it, uh, to conduct the electrical current, you can make your own little simple battery. So, and you can also build some batteries out of coins. You can get copper pennies, you can get nickels for example, and you can put the nickel and copper pennies in a stack and put a little piece of uh, paper towel in between them so it can solve the solution, sodium chloride. And that'll work as a battery as well. So you're going to use these today. And uh, to make a battery, batteries were first known as voltaic cells, after Volta who discovered them. The technique we're going to basically use today is to take a beaker. So you've got some beaker sitting at your desks here. They're 150 mil Pyrex beakers. I'm going to give you some electrodes. We're going to put 
metals. Instead of putting everything into the same container, we're going to use two separate containers. You'll, get a, you'll make a better battery by using two different cells instead of one cell. We're going to use potassium nitrate solution. We're going to connect the two half cells together with potassium nitrate solution. And we're going to put some copper and zinc electrodes in just like this. We're going to use a digital molding meter to actually measure the voltage. And uh, again, it's chemical energy being converted to electrical energy. I'll go into the theory of this, but different metals have different capacities for uh, making voltage. Right, so you're familiar with all these different types of batteries, dry cells, lead acid batteries, which are in our cars, alkaline batteries, which we use to power electronics, uh, zinc, silver oxide batteries, and say cell, well not cell phones, but in uh, watches, nickel cad, rechargeable batteries, which have been out for a long time. And then the newer one on the market now, which is the lithium battery. The lithium batteries create the most energy. They're the ones that are used in the different types of cars and even in our computers. You can even buy new high-powered flashlights that are powered off of lithium batteries, but you have to be very careful about using these types of batteries because they can catch fire. If you penetrate the battery and poke a hole in it, they'll essentially blow up. So if you buy one of these new, uh, well, flashlights that run off of lithium batteries, okay, when you mix an old battery with a new one or different brands of batteries, they can explode. Catch up. Not only explode and cause a burn to yourself, but they can catch fire and maybe possibly burn your house down. So they're police and use these a lot, firemen use them a lot in their professional occupation, soldiers do as well. But I wouldn't recommend them for kids. Okay? But uh, lithium batteries are the most powerful. They're the ones that are used to power cars. Right, so uh, I have a little video up here that you're going to watch. See this will scratch off the screen here. I wonder, I didn't think that they might not have sound here. You know, if they have sound. These days, everyone's heard of lithium ion batteries, but what makes them so special? First of all, each battery is made up of many smaller batteries called cells. Let's take a closer look at one to see how it works. The electrical current reaches the cells via conductive surfaces, in this case, aluminum on one side and copper on the other. And just as in every other battery, there's a positive and negative electrode called the cathode and the anode. The cathode, or positive electrode, is made of a very pure lithium metal oxide. The more uniform its chemical composition, the better the performance, and the longer the battery life is. As you'd expect, the anode, or negative electrode, is located on the other side. It's made of graphite, a form of carbon with a layered structure. The battery is filled with a transport medium, the electrolyte, so that the lithium ions carrying the battery's charge can flow freely. This electrolyte must be extremely pure and as free of water as possible in order to ensure efficient charging and discharging. To prevent a short circuit, there's a layer placed between the two electrodes, the separator. To the tiny lithium ions, the separator is actually permeable. The experts call this property microporosity. Let's take a look at what happens when a battery is charged. The positively charged lithium ions pass from the cathode through the separator into the layered graphite structure of the anode where they're stored. Now the battery is charged. When the battery discharges, that is when energy is removed from the cell, the lithium ions travel via the electrolyte from the anode through the separator back to the cathode. The motor converts the electrical energy into mechanical energy, making the car go. The amount of energy available and how long the batteries last is closely related to the quality of the materials used. To sum it all up, higher quality, pure materials along with customized formulations lead to longer battery life and better battery performance. And, let's see. All right, so, 
Here's a short video. I don't think I'll show up all of you. This one doesn't have to play. It's not nice.
going to run some chemical reactions. Okay, I'm going to show you some chemical changes that can happen in order to create energy. And the first thing that I want you to do is take one of your test tubes. There's two groups here. And take one of these little pieces of copper thread. Take this little piece of copper mesh, put it inside the test tube, and you can use your pencil to poke it down. Poke it. Yeah. Yeah, and just poke it into the test tube with the pencil. Do you have a ten? Okay, good. Poke it all the way in. Because we're going to cover it up with a chemical solution. So we want it to be down here toward the bottom. And then once you've done that, I'm going to come around with a special solution. It's actually a silver solution. And we're going to cover that up. It's all black. And you can put it into your test tube holder. And you can watch for changes. And I think I have at least one magnifying glass at each table. And you can look to see if there's any changes. This would be a chemical change. Well, you want to poke it all the way down in there. That's excellent. That's the best way. This is silver nitrate solution. It's not too dangerous. Medical doctors used to put it in the eyes of newborn infants to kill germs and bacteria to keep them from going blind. <laughs> and then it might take a minute or so. But
Go ahead and put those little zinc nodules into the second test tube. How are you? And then we're going to cover them up with another solution. And this might take a little while for the reaction to occur as well. But these are all examples of chemical reactions that take place when metals are Just do your thing like I'm not here. to the blue color of the solution is it getting lighter, darker, or no change? It's actually probably should be getting lighter. I tried to make a little animation, a cartoon to show you what's happening. Right, so we've got zinc, solid, plus copper ions. This is the chemical reaction, which is probably a little bit too much for you. The copper solution is blue. The zinc, zinc solutions are colorless. And it starts out with copper being blue. When they contact the zinc, they pick up two electrons and they become zinc copper metal. And then the zinc goes into solution. So they're changing places. The zinc metal is actually going into solution as ions and the copper ions are going out of solution and becoming copper metal. So after some period of time, you're going to see that the color, as shown here, goes from darker blue to lighter blue. And finally, when all the uh, copper is used up in the solution, when all the precipitates out of this copper metal, it becomes colorless. So if you waited long enough, it would become colorless. Let me show it one more time. <laughs> I actually made this animation in a program called Flash, made by Adobe. If some of you are interested in that, you might want to look, look at learning how to do computer animations. They're kind of fun to do. The copper comes out of solution. The solution is, becomes lighter and less blue. And the zinc goes into the solution. Zinc makes a colorless solution. And there's energy associated with these processes. And batteries actually harness the energy. Right, so what we're going to do next is we're actually going to build a battery. And I can, I, it looks like I have some extras up here, so I'll use those. So here I've got two beakers. You're going to need two electrodes. You're going to need a zinc electrode, so if you can pass one of those out. 
teach group. Give me one too, by the way. And you're going to need a copper electro. I'll pass those out. Don't cut yourself with them, okay? They're kind of sharp. Usually I clean these up first by sanding them down. But I think that some of you might cut yourselves if you sand them down, so we're not going to do that. <laughs> Great, so here's the way it works. I want you to try to hang these electrodes into the beaker. I think they have little notches in them to hang them in. I think this, if the zinc is big enough, we can just put it in there. So they're going to kind of be like this. And then what we have to do is we have to put copper and zinc solutions. We have to put copper solution in the beaker that contains the uh, copper electrode. So it's going to be like this. Here you can see I've got a beaker with a copper in it. I have to put some copper solution in there. I have to be able to cover part of that electrode, kind of like this. And then zinc solution goes in the other one. So why don't we come around and do that? I've got the zinc here. I'll do the zinc first. You want to go around and pour the copper solution? It just had, don't fill the beaker, just the, the electro has to be in the unit. Beakers, okay. This this is never going to work the way it's set up yet. We're going to have to connect all the beakers together in a couple of ways to make a complete electrical circuit, okay. So that's where your little alligator clips come in. You've got to connect one alligator clip to the copper electrode. You can take it out if you want to do that. Put it in like that, and then connect the other end going to connect to one end of the digital multimeter. doesn't matter what terminal it goes on. Set, take the second alligator clip and put it on the zinc electrode. This isn't <laughs> Try to make a nice solid connection. And then as I said, connect the alligator clips to either of the probes that we have here. Be right there.
Sarah. And if you've done that, you're almost finished in setting up your battery. The problem is that these two beakers aren't connected together to make a circuit. That's where the piece of filter paper comes in. What we're going to do, I'm going to come around with the solution, is that we're going to take this filter paper, which could probably could be paper, towel, or coffee filter. We've got to immerse it into this salt solution to make it wet, potassium nitrate. And then you drape it across the two beakers, okay, into the solution, just like that. And then if you turn your battery on, okay, then it should probably give you a current or a voltage. And I'm getting like one volt out of this, okay. So let me come around with that. This sucks. Put it in there. Maybe take it out like this. And I want you to adjust it. And you probably don't want to go over the electrode, you want to have the electrode on the other side. I've got more filler paper up here. Concentration of copper and the zinc higher, or by raising the temperature, I can increase the voltage. You're getting something there? About one volt. Really not bad from this very simple operation. I mean, okay, so chemists have this pretty much nailed down. This is called a voltaic cell or a simple battery. It works better if you have the two half cells separate like this. And putting, if you put everything in the same beaker, it runs down pretty quickly. Okay, and then you just get the two reacting like, like in our first experiment, they're in the same cell, you get this type of thing happening. Alright, right, so in your little books here, 
you can actually write down what your voltage is, find the copper zinc cell, and write down what voltage you got. And then we can calculate how much energy. Calculate how much energy comes out of this volt. We'll take 2 times 96,500 times 1 volt. And that'll give you the energy in joules. One volt. Yeah, that's all you got. Point oh one. Okay, so yeah, that's kind of small. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's a negative one volt, but it's still one volt. If you reverse these, if you reverse the black and the red, you would get a positive one volt here. Yeah. Yeah, well, what you do, you just move it to the range where you get the best reading. This, this one is too small. These are actually, all these have the same reading, but like in different metric for SLU. And so then for this, there's the picture. And to get the energy, you take the calculator 2 times 96,000 times 1 times 1 volt. It looks like it's about 200,000 joules or 2 kilojoules. That's not very much energy for a chemical reaction. Okay? That's not even the amount of energy that you can get from eating a candy bar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think I once calculated how many fish I have to do to lose like a pound of weight, like 50,000. Okay? So, what we can do is we can change the metals. If we change the metals, we have to change the solutions too. So, uh, you know, the only other metal that I brought here was lead. And seeing that we have a lot of little kids here, the parents may not want them to handle, handle the lead. So, if you're a kid without a parent, I'm not going to give you the lead. But I have these lead electrodes. Incidentally, the Romans love lead, okay? Here I've got some here. Touching it won't hurt you, okay? Lead tends to be soft. It's malleable, it's a metal that's malleable, it's very soft. And the Romans purified it, they used it in it. Does anybody know where the Romans used lead? Yeah, they used it for plumbing. And so they actually gave lead the Latin name plumbium. Plumbium, the chemical symbol for lead is PB. It comes from the Latin word plumbium, which means plumbing, because that's what they used it for. But after a long time, they all got sick from the lead that would dissolve in their water. If you get a little bit on your hands, it's not a big deal. All right? But sometimes our students mix up the lead and the zinc, so they'll put the zinc back in the lead because they, the lead container because they look the same. But lead is soft and malleable, and zinc isn't. That's how you can tell the difference. So he wants to try to make a lead battery. I have a parent. Well, raise your hands off. So what, I want, what I'm going to come around and do first is uh, I'm going to collect your uh, zinc solution. So I'm going to pick that up for you. I'm going to take out your little piece of filter paper. Take this out. And then what I want you to do is I want you to take the zinc electrodes, take all those, and you go down and get all those. So pour your zinc, take your zinc electrode out, and take your zinc electrode Just leave it there. We need to use it. Just, yeah, you don't need to take it out.
be able to finish the, uh, the Lenny Electros, but you get the idea, okay? So basically what I wanted to show you today is that chemical reactions can produce energy from a very, very simple process of just having two different metals immersed in the right solution. The chemists have known about this for many years, and they're using the basics of these ideas to construct batteries. The new lithium batteries are a lot, lot more difficult to understand than any of these batteries. But Understanding this maybe will land you a job in the future where you make maybe a hundred thousand bucks or more a year. Okay? So if you're interested in science education, you must be to be here. I want you to continue, continue with your science education. From what I've seen, you've got a very, very good college right here in Jackson to start your studies. Think you should continue with it. Okay? Thank you.